Uh, but today what we're going to talk about uh, with, with my very esteemed panel here is blockchain in the enterprise. Oftentimes with, with, with blockchain, uh, the, the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency topics usually dominate that conversation. However, we're seeing a huge wave of activity starting to occur in the enterprise using blockchain for perhaps non-traditional blockchain workloads. And so we're going to talk about that today. And the most important bit here is we're going to talk about real life stories. So my name is Mike Walker. I'm going to be your moderator for today. Um, I work for Microsoft. Uh, I'm in the Applied Innovation Group. And I help our strategic 500 customers around the globe with emerging technologies. Technologies like blockchain, augmented reality, mixed reality, quantum, et cetera, lots of interesting technologies. The higher order bit is building the actual solutions. And today, we've got a, uh, some really good folks here that have really interesting perspectives on this particular industry. So first, who I'd like to introduce is Sean Moser. So Sean. Uh, so Sean is an executive at GE Aviation. And so within GE Aviation, there is a digital group. And this digital group provides services not only to internal GE, but to the entire aviation industry. So they're using blockchain in a really, really interesting way. And so he's going to provide some perspectives on that. Um, he's been in this industry for close to 30 years. And he spanned the gambit of developer to creative designer to information architect to now uh, senior executive. Uh, he is the chief product officer for GE Aviation. Second, we've got Betsabe Botadis, and she is a co-founder of Icon. And what they focus on is they're a startup that's solving the identity problem around blockchain. She has a wealth of industry experience in fintech, so she's going to be able to ground us in you know, some very real world problems around dealing with identity. And there's going to be lots of buzzwords that we're going to try to demystify for you as well. Ashley Lanquist, uh, she's with the World Economic Forum. And so she's going to round us out and give us that global perspective. She's going to be able to help us understand, woo, things are dropping. Um, she's going to help us understand uh, from a broad global perspective, a standards perspective on, you know, where is blockchain really used, how it's used, the deployment aspects, etc. So we've got some really interesting perspectives from across the spectrum of from strategy to execution and deployment. Some interesting fun facts here is, uh, Sean, I understand you like to cook. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that passion of yours. Okay, so... Um... Uh, it, you know, you, when you're when you're a developer or anything that you you where you actually get to deliver stuff, there's a really satisfying kind of experience where you hand over the thing that you've done and you get that feedback. I don't get to do any of that anymore as an executive. You don't get to deliver anything. You're just kind of pushing things forward a little bit every single day, and it's really annoying. So the beautiful thing about cooking is I get to finish my day every day, kind of uh, creating a plan identifying my requirements, getting my materials, executing my plan, delivering it to my customer and getting immediate feedback from my customer and finishing something at the end of every day. So it's, it's a cathartic, it, you know, it's, I'm not part of the kind of food TV generation. I just want to get something done every day. And so that's how I do it. Nice. And so interesting about you, Betsa Bay. Um, so maybe a fun fact about you that you could share with the audience. Well, when you're cooking, you have to pair it with alcohol, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so, um, I love bourbons. So I have a really, really long, um, big collection of bourbons and whiskeys. And every time that I go out and have drinks with the guys, and they order wine, it actually happened a few minutes ago, they order wine or they order something else, they always give my bourbon or my beers to the guys, and they give me the white wine to me. And like, no. <laughs> So that's, that's just, it always happens. Nice. And actually, you and I actually have something in common. So um, uh, I've got fraternal twins, two boys, and you are a... I'm an identical twin. And my twin is currently in China today speaking at a conference. But she does what I do for AI. So it's pretty fun. And we have a hashtag. It's called Twins in Tech. You can follow it. Nice. <laughs> All right. 
So let's go ahead and get into it. So, Sean, so you're an executive at a huge multinational company, a uh, highly regulated industry. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about when you're talking to uh, your customers, to your executives within GE Aviation Digital, uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, why blockchain? What is the value that you're really getting out of this? Yeah, so uh, aviation obviously is a pretty, uh, it, I find it to be really fascinating, a uh, really interesting industry. Um, it's similar to financial in that it's globally regulated. It's similar to um, uh, sort of hospitality in that you have a whole, thousands and thousands of people that are you know, uh, moderate income people that are touching your customer every day. And then it's a lot like telco in that you have these huge capital infrastructure investments that you make, and then you sell shares of on a highly commoditized, low margin rate. So for us, there's a couple of things. Safety is the biggest priority. And uh, where we're focusing blockchain is a lot on things that looking at when we deliver something, there's the whole upstream component. So how do you manage back to birth so that you can actually identify all the way back as far as possible where this thing came from and all the people that touched it along the way? That's a critical component to safety and maintenance. And then once you deliver that out to kind of the operating environment, how do you measure that over time and who touched it, who maintained it, who took care of it, and did they do the right things? So, uh, so there's the kind of from delivery outbound downstream side. Today, that's managed in a really cumbersome way, um, using a lot of pretty manual processes that create a lot of overhead, and it's hard to deal with the velocity of the business. We're gonna double the global fleet over the next 10 years, um, plus you're gonna add about 15 million commercial, commercially registered drones to the flying fleet. Um, being able to track those things and keep the world safe is, is uh, a challenge we all take seriously. And what's really interesting, so, so we've been working together for a yep. while now, for what, close to a year, something like yep. that? And some of the things that we've discovered along our journey together is that with blockchain, uh, you're going to find that there are different ways to orchestrate these blockchain environments. Yeah. And, you know, we oftentimes hear the word consortium. And that can unfortunately be extremely misleading, especially when you're having a business conversation. Because consortium has prior art in the legal industry. It means we've got a nonprofit company that we're going to be doing certain things together, and there's specific legal rules around that. However, what we're finding with, with, with our work together is that you will have these ecosystems and different types of ecosystems. Some will be permissionless, but some will be various forms of permissioned type of environments. And so, Sean, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what does yeah. that mean from an economic value perspective to GE Aviation? Yeah, just to be clear. So the, the whole point of, you know, when you're going into some of these things in the enterprise, Let's not kid ourselves. Um, implementing a new technology isn't done just because it's interesting. It's also not done because it's fun or cool. It's not done because it's sexy. Um, it actually has to have a real material value. Uh, so the, the primary question you ask is, okay, well, why, why don't I just use a database for this or whatever? Um, so consortium is super scary. Um, that was a thing that kind of really froze a lot of the GE people on their tracks. And the reason is um, there is an amount of uh, responsibility that falls upon somebody like a GE if, if you're, you're providing kind of engines for most of powered flight. You need to be able to, to authenticate that. So for one of the things we did was we did um, condition-based maintenance, meaning Today, if you get, like if you went and bought something, there would be a predicted failure rate on that that says, hey, you can use it for this long and then it probably will fail. That is then the rule of law in aviation. You will pull that thing at that time. What we found though was in areas like uh, uh, one of our big airline customers operates out of the Middle East, they fly through a lot of sand, the engines don't last that long you have to pull them sooner. So we developed condition-based systems. 
the responsibility is then on the OEM to make sure that that thing is being operated safely. So what we're using blockchain for, we can measure. We know the specific thing we want to do. We know exactly how much it's going to save us. And I can thread that all the way through. So you got to have like a big vision of where you're going to get to, but then you got to have a small thread that you can pull all the way through and prove that that's right. And you can prove the ROI. Uh, and so we're running kind of what you would call a founder-led model. We as the OEM can say to our suppliers, you have to do this. And we as the OEM can say to all the people that maintain the product, you have to do this. What we're using blockchain for is to create a chain that connects all that and actually reduces the burden and improves, uh, reduces the latency in that system today. So today it's done with paper, it's done, uh, you know, like I said, very manually. We can make that very immediate, very current, and we can know exactly at any given point in time where those things are, and we can measure that, and we can put dollars around that. If you don't do that, um, it's really hard, and, and, and there are, in my industry alone, there's about 60 consortiums that are spun up around blockchain. None of them have delivered anything yet. So creating a, a consortium of a whole bunch of people that are going to identify a way that we're all going to work together when there's actually no legislation or incentive to do so, I mean, it sounds nice, but it doesn't actually ever get done. So we're going to do it, and then we're doing it for us, and then we're going to open that up and, and invite others to join. But if you can't create a measurable return for your business, uh, it's probably not going to go anywhere. And so what you're hearing here from a practical perspective, which Sean is articulating, is you have to start with what problem am I trying to solve here? Sometimes your business doesn't know what problem they're trying to solve. So they're in, they're in this world of I don't know what I don't know. And so part of that journey could be for you is to help educate, but also to ideate around the potential opportunities that blockchain can provide to your organization. And oftentimes we get stuck into the very light and fluffy trust conversation. Trust is like truth. It's in the eye of the beholder. It means different things to different people. And so instead of saying this is a trust-based architecture, talking about it in terms of the capability that it delivers to your business that can tie directly to business value. So start with we don't know what we don't know build a strategy that's topical to your business, to the specific concerns of your business, to the disruptions in your marketplace. For aviation, what Sean had alluded to is, you know, there is a lot of activity going on, a lot of false starts, and they need leadership in the industry to have a common data model across the marketplace. And so starting there is essential. POC and pilots are great, but if they cannot accrue to measurable value, it will not go anywhere. And I can tell you from a Microsoft perspective, you know, we've got you know, 800 customers and an active pipeline that we're working with in a direct way around blockchain initiatives. And we find 90% of the time, customers that start with a POC and just start kicking the tires, they don't go anywhere. They stall out or it's a multi-year engagement. The folks that are very deliberate with their strategy and address real world issues, real world challenges, get much, much further along. So along those lines, Betsabe, you are in the identity space. That is a wildly topical conversation for enterprises that are trying to bring together multiple parties into these blockchain ecosystems. Maybe tell us a little bit about your perspective on how to crack that nut, demystify the identity space for folks on that critical component. Absolutely. Well, um, first I would like to ask a quick question to the audience, to you. When you hear the word identity on the blockchain, is every, what do you think? Are you thinking about self? Please raise your hand those that are thinking about self-sovereignty. Oh, not that many. Most of the time when I'm speaking and we talk about identity, the first concept that goes in the first word that comes to mind is self serene identity, which in the blockchain environment means we're going to give 100% power to the consumer. But in the enterprise world, it doesn't really work like that. Why would I give 
Why would GE or any other consumer, B2C, consumer-facing enterprise, will give 100% of um, control of the data to the consumer? What is the value there? Are they, what, what Sean was saying about in order to implement a, an emerging technology, in this case blockchain, there has to be a material, real value. But as consumers, when we think about identity, it will be so great to have a unique identity, a unique number, a unique whatever it is, that it can carry ac across an environment or an ecosystem, that that's what you were referring earlier today. An environment where it doesn't matter whether it's a consortium, which is a centralized database, again, it's just a group of people putting data together and technology together, or in a public blockchain. So really, one of these concepts that we have with identity that has, hasn't been able to solve is coming together and saying, what does identity mean? What does identity mean for an individual and consumer perspective? What does identity mean for an asset, whether I purchase a trip, the, tra the, the ticket, whether I purchase a refrigerator, a pair of shoes, each of those assets eventually we have an identity. But what is the importance of those identities? How it adds value both to the enterprise and to the consumer if it doesn't connect to the real world? So what we see when we talk constantly with enterprises, um, we're a small startup and we're starting to sell to some companies. And what we see is always, what we hear always is we just want to be in blockchain because we think it's important. But they don't really understand why is it important and how does, how does identity place an importance on it? Um, another thing is when we talk to consumers, the consumers want magic to happen. I want Delta or any other airlines to know all my transactions and treat me as a king or queen. I want this magic to happen, but I'm not really willing to give my data. I want my privacy. And then you have this side as a, and the enterprise side that they have to deal with regulatory issues, GD, GDPR, and then identify is the personal identification ident uh, information part of the blockchain registry. Should that be together? So really, we are still, as an industry, trying to identify how we can make the magic happen. But I think that what ICON is doing to work it is doing right to start moving the needle, it's really fine. Let's, let's do simple conversations. Let's start with the basics. Let's focus on access controls on the blockchain and hierarchical key management. Simple basis of identifying what data of identity should actually be on the blockchain and what data should, be, should not be on the blockchain. So. No, so, so what I'm hearing you say is, you know, identity is a big problem and there's many different facets to it. Now, as you're going through some of these projects and initiatives and you're helping customers, what are some of the key challenges that you're seeing that might, you know, some of the folks in the audience that go, okay, yeah, I agree with you, Betsa Bay, that identity is a challenge, but, you know, what are some of the common hurdles that uh, they should understand before jumping in? First, um, identifying the problem. 100%, I still, we keep seeing that over and over. And in the enterprise world, there are some groups that still don't understand, 100% understand the, the, the stack. But in, specifically in identity, is again, what are the pieces of the identity that pertains to the blockchain? And why are you putting it on the blockchain? How is that providing value to your users? Um, one of our, of our clients um, is an online marketplace for freelancers. And for them, it was a no-brainer. Because so we just want all our consumers, all our freelancers to be on the blockchain. We want the data on the blockchain. And they did it because they felt they can give the transparency to know where is the freelancer, where part of the world it is, and enable um, smart contracts to execute the transaction what the fr freelancer has delivered. But also gives the protection to the freelancer that they're gonna get paid when they deliver the job. It was simple for them. But the, the uh, freelancer has an identity. The person that is, that is getting the service has an identity. But it's, 
Beyond that is that each transaction has an identity and it has worked for them. But they are over across the time, they keep finding solutions of more data that they need to, to be able to provide better services. Um, there are so many challenges, but really it's simple. It's get to know your consumer. How do, they, how do they feel about you having the data or how do they feel about you managing their key or having hierarchical key management? Are you, as a consumer, do you really want the business to transact on your behalf? I can tell you that I personally, I want to. I don't want to have to manage all my data. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's super interesting. And, you know, from, from my perspective, what, what I've seen a lot of times is, again, these terms are a bit overloaded. When we say self-sovereign, we assume that it has to be the consumer owns everything and controls everything. There's going to be a degree of variability there on the problem that you're trying to solve. So if you are part of a airline loyalty program, there's going to be a certain level of delegation and management that you're going to, you know, give to, you know, One World or the Sky Team Alliance or what have you. Uh, if this is a government-ran e-citizen ID, well, you're going to have a lot more control over, over that. So it really depends, again, to your point, Betsa Bay, around that core business problem that you're trying to solve and making sure that you architect these blockchain solutions, whether it be a, a specific solution or its uh, identity, that it's fit for purpose. And along those lines, you know, Ashley, you're doing a lot of cool wor work at the uh, World Economic Forum. You know, one of them being, you know, in the automotive space, you know, connecting vehicles and all that great stuff. Maybe, you know, talk a little bit about um, some of the best practices and maybe deployment and how that all works in your mind. Yes, thank you. So I've been at the World Economic Forum for almost a year and a half now. And I really wanted to share with you three practical lessons sort of learned from the trenches related to how we at the World Economic Forum believe any blockchain deployments should work and be accompanied with. So uh, number one is make sure you've really identified the problem, as we've spoken about already. Number two is to develop deployment policies around the technology solution, and I'll get into each of these. And number three is to seek out and have multi-sector input into the solution. So for the first one, I'm mentioning this, it almost seems so obvious that you want to understand the problem, but it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up where um, organizations, governments, um, enterprises, startups, whomever, who are thinking about deploying blockchain technology, even we at the forum as we're exploring where we're going to focus our energy, must spend even more time than we already are really understanding the problem. So what is the actual problem? And is it a problem that a core feature of blockchain technology is well fit to address? Or can a simple digital solution or an alternative digital solution, centralized solution, solve that problem? What are alternatives? And what are the pros and cons of the alternatives? And also analyzing the downsides that would come with using blockchain. There's always going to be trade-offs and downsides, scalability, whatever it might be. So after that analysis, is the problem very fitting for blockchain technology, where blockchain is very um, well poised to address that problem, net of risks, downsides, and after considering alternatives. So this is very important. And then the second one, deployment policies. So at the forum, we sort of take a holistic approach to how blockchain technologies should be deployed such that they're effective, inclusive, responsible, good for people, good for the world. And one of those is to really consider deployments in a, from a holistic perspective. So um, I manage two government-related projects in particular. One is on central bank digital currency, and the other is an anti-corruption solution uh, with the, um, the government of Colombia and with the Inter-American Development Bank. And for these, any of these types of deployments, you want citizen input, you want input from the people that you're affecting on the ground, even if it's an enterprise, user input. 
maybe develop user guides or instructions or deal with and work with the people who would actually be using the solution so it's effectively used and deployed. We know all too well in the blockchain space, particularly in the decentralized application land, that user experience is too difficult right now. And we're not actually necessarily solving real needs. So you know, problems number, uh, tasks number one and two. And that's holding up adoption. Uh, other deployment policies could be evaluating the legal landscape, really thoroughly evaluating the risks and creating mitigation strategies of any particular deployment, establishing upfront key performance indicators and metrics, and strategies on how you're going to monitor this deployment, sort of the governance um, around it, when you might want to retract the deployment, how you want to make sure that it's, it's, um, it's being effective. And then the third one is seeking multi-sector or multi-stakeholder input. So we need input and consideration from not only the technologists, but also perhaps lawmakers, the citizens, as mentioned, um, different types of technologists, uh, the private sector, and different types of organizations that can contribute to the product, civil society, nonprofits, um, in order to make sure that it's as effective and inclusive and safe and responsible, as we call it at the World Economic Forum, as possible. So that's sort of um, the, the lessons that I've learned from working at the forum on these two projects so far that I wanted to share with you. No, that, that is really awesome. And you know, I want to key off of one of the points you made, which I think uh, doesn't get a whole lot of airtime, which is the factors that companies cannot control. So those external disruptions that your company can't control. And from a World Economic Forum perspective, you guys do a lot of great work there. Maybe you know, help us understand a little bit you know, the effects of other technology disruption that's forcing you down a blockchain path, or you know, the rapid pace of digital transformation, et cetera. Help us understand maybe in the context of one of the initiatives that you've worked on, how that impacts. Yeah, so for both of these projects, Central Bank Digital Currency and the Anti-Corruption, which is really a government transparency project in Colombia, they're very affected by external factors. Um, speaking for the latter first, this government transparency project, there's a lot of Colombian laws and requirements that we didn't fully consider upfront as we were planning our deployment. So uh, we, we're creating a pilot. It's on public permissionless Ethereum with awesome input from experts like QuantStamp and Blockchain at Berkeley and other experts, um, Prism Group. And, and this will run a public procurement process on blockchain. That's the site where probably the most amounts of government corruption um, is lost and, and occurs. Uh, however, we can't legally force people to use this blockchain solution rather than the existing e-procurement solution. So what if some people don't use it? You know, would that render the whole pilot um, ineffectual? So that's one question. And then related to central bank digital currency, I've been covering this for about a year and a half. However, in June, when the Libra announcement happened, and then later when the PBOC's potential CBDC announcement happened, there's been a lot more impetus and interest in CBDC. And it's actually affecting a bit how the central bank researchers are considering the technology. They're looking at stable coins a lot more. They're looking very closely at the Libra token. Um, it's been reported in Coindesk and all over uh, quite widely that it's sort of bringing into question again whether we need to create central bank digital currency to serve as an alternative to the Libra token and to stable coins and to other CBDCs uh, to serve as um, the, another option for citizens and to protect the monetary systems of the economies. So many different complex issues. So. Right. No, that, that's really cool. And, you know, I think, you know, from a big evil company, you know, being at Microsoft. Um, and I can joke about it because I work there, uh, but you guys can't. Um, so, you know, at Microsoft, our aperture is fairly large and, you know, we see a lot of these same issues. And, you know, it's really forced us to take a step back and really build out uh, a set of playbooks to, to really quickly be able to address these issues. And to your point, you know, when we look at this problem, we look at three major segments of the problem. We look at you know, kind of the, the first area with formation that, one, you have to take a very deliberate innovation approach uh, to this problem. Challenge conventional thinking. 
um, you know, really start to engage with your business professionals in a very different way, meaning get them involved early. Don't just wait to kind of design something and throw something over the fence. You got to get them involved early in the process. The lawyers, the, you know, you know, I lovingly say all the no people. So, you know, your risk management folks, et cetera, the folks that may be intimidated by these technologies, you got to bring them in early because until you do that, you're never really going to really understand the problem. And frankly, as technology professionals, if things go sideways, you don't have to deal with it. It's the guys that cut the checks and the gals that could go to jail if bad things happen. Those are the folks that own those, those decisions. So you have to make sure that they're in the room early to help define those problems that we've been talking about. Second is being very deliberate around the business model. What we've quickly found is most large enterprises will have a ecosystem of ecosystem strategy meaning that they will have multiple implementations of blockchain. One piece of it may be completely open and permissionless, and in, in other pieces may be private permissioned blockchains, and that's okay. But again, it goes back to what sort of value are you creating at the end of the day? And lastly, creating an options-based transformation plan because there's not one way of doing this. And being able to provide your executives with multiple different options on perhaps how aggressive do you wanna be with your innovation strategy? If you wanna conquer the world in a year, that's gonna look very different if you're gonna do a fast follower approach or if you want to take a very risk adverse approach and slowly build something out. So Sean, you know, since we've been working a lot together on these sorts of aspects, you know, Maybe help me understand what you see as some common kind of um, inhibitors, uh, whether it be organizationally, whether it be technically. You know, what are some of the things that have been real blockers that you can maybe give some advice on? Yeah, I mean, I think the the points that both uh, Ashley and Betsy brought up as well. I think we've all kind of experienced some of the same things. Just don't talk about it from a technology perspective. Uh, a blockchain is a kind of a really interesting, sexy, buzzy kind of thing, and so from a from a customer poll perspective, you know, I will literally have customers say, "Well, what are you doing with blockchain?" As if that's an a result. It's not. And if I go try internally to get funding for blockchain, I'm not going to get any. So, but so I I would say the big inhibitors are. Uh, when you're marketing externally, absolutely market the hell out of blockchain. Um, it it it's it's it shows that you're kind of embracing the new. You're trying to solve problems in different ways. But internally, I don't talk about it at all. We talk about reducing cost, reducing latency, improving trust, improving security, tangible, measurable things, de-risking our entire value chain and improving communication across that value chain with a common source of truth. And what does that mean to the business? So I think you really got to get back to, like as we were saying, the, the whys, the what's the value, what's the return, um, because that then you can kind of equate to some dollar amount that you're willing to invest to get there. Otherwise, it's a non-starter. That's why. And I, I, I wanted to say that as we talk to more enterprises, exactly what you are saying is what we are learning being on the other side of the table. Like when you come to talking about blockchain and identity, it's like, what? what is that? And immediately doors are shut. But when you are coming, it's like, okay, let's focus on efficiency, pro productivity, like how do you really contact to your consumer, val value creation, so and on. The conversations start to change, but I feel like the word blockchain, it should be almost eliminated from the complete pitch every time that we're talking to enterprise. And in our perspective, we building identity solutions, what we really are trying to get is that the uh, executives trying to understand that, it, that there can be a lot of technology solutions, but there has to be one thing that is in common, identity, something that carries, it can carry across all the ecosystems and environments. And to be able to take that message out there has been a huge challenge. Because it's like, well, what do I care about the identity of my consumer to be connected to the identity of, I don't know, a Walmart or anything? 
blockchain's a how, not a what. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't have time for Q and A because we started a little bit late. So we're going to hang out, uh, you know, outside. So if you have any questions, you know, certainly come and and ask some questions uh, uh, to us. But uh, you know, kind of how I want to cap this off, guys, is you know maybe each one of us, starting with Ashley, if we could just communicate one key takeaway that you want the audience to take out of kind of what you've what you've communicated here today. Think strongly about what the problem is you're trying to solve and make sure that blockchain provides a capability that well solves that problem uh, beyond over what is another or traditional digital solution would solve. Yeah, and I would, I would just add to that. It's, this is like cloud or IoT or any other huge kind of uh, shift in the technology landscape. It's a how, not a what, you know, to the point that, that we were making earlier. Um, we need to redefine the description of self-sovereign identity. It will, in my opinion, will never be 100 a consumer will never have 100% control and access to data. But I think that we can come to define identity who there are certain parts of the identity that we have control and certain parts that we really want to share. Um, but we need to have this baseline and the mechanism and technology that enable us to decide when to share the data. No, great points. And you know, uh, what I'll add to the already great feedback is, you know, listen, you know, the opportunity potential of blockchain is enormous. Uh, by some estimates, they say $3.1 trillion uh, of business value is going to be created just over the next five years uh, with blockchain-based solutions in the enterprise. That's a lot of economic value. However, what we found in our own implementations internally at Microsoft, you know, we found very simple processes, reconciliation processes, where you know, uh, we've identified in our Xbox royalty management practice, we cut our operational staff in half. We saved $2 million within the first quarter of the implementation. Huge, huge returns. And that's just one of many projects. But at the end of the day, what it required was it required a level of business acumen. It required us to check the buzzwords at the door. It required us to think about this more from a capability perspective rather than a, you know, a buzzwordy, trust, hypothetical type of situation. But also knowing that of even the most perfect blockchain solution, blockchain is only 10 to 15 to 20% of that overall solution. Realizing that blockchain is providing a lot of value, but it's on the back end. And so realizing that traditional databases, even within a blockchain solution, doesn't go away. We're still gonna have off-chain repositories. So we gotta be very careful not to throw the proverbial baby out with the bath, bath water. And whatever parent came up with that analogy is a really bad parent. But at any rate, I digress. So the point here is, yes, focus on that business problem, but also bring in the right people at the right time. You know, balance out the hype, use it to your advantage to what Sean said. You know, that's the sexy factor to get people's attention, but quickly shift to how you're going to help the organization. And with that, we're out of time. Thank you guys very much for coming.